Welcome back to Division One Rejects. This is Kobe Manzo, your host, episode 126. Football is back in all facets. High school, college has been going on for a little while now. Tonight, Thursday night, as I'm recording this, it's, it's actually after midnight right now as I'm talking to you right now. The Lions just beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead, baby. Craziness. But we're not going to talk a whole lot about that. We got some great D2, D3 football to discuss tonight. This is uh, September 7th. I'm recording this. Two great guests join me tonight. We got Sheen Butler Lawson Jr. from Minnesota State. If you haven't seen what he did this week, just wait till you hear about it. The dude was averaging over 25 yards per carry. He's a dog. Uh, we talk to him here soon. And then we've got uh, Aaron Borgerding from uh, UW River Falls. That squad, their huge win over the Crusaders from UMHB, Mary Harden, Baylor this past week. Probably the upset of the week in Division Three football. They looked dominant over there on their home field. We'll talk to him later, the defensive back who had an interception there and uh, helped them get out to a great early lead. Otherwise, we got some Week 2 game previews. We've got, uh, you know, kind of the headlines, I guess, of the Division Two side of things. Number 2, Colorado Mines goes to number 6, Angelo State. That one's going to be huge, awesome matchup. We talk a lot about that. Number 20, CSU Pueblo is going to number 4, GVSU. GV, two Colorado schools, probably the best two Colorado schools back-to-back in two weeks here. GV's got to bounce back after that home opening loss, or season opening loss, excuse me. And then on the D3 side of things, we've got uh, Mary Harden Baylor looking to bounce back versus number 5, Trinity. And then uh, number 11, Lacrosse versus number 6, Harden-Simmons. We've got St. John's and uh, Whitewater. A lot of great stuff to talk about as far as those games are concerned. We are going to cover... That with uh, Jimmy Martin, who will join me. We talk about D3, our D3 insider for Division One Rejects. And then other pieces tonight, it's pretty straightforward. We got a piece from Wayne Cavati talking about some D2 players on NFL rosters. There's a lot of them. All right? I guess a question for you, before we get to that, what position do you think has the most Division Two players in the NFL? So, like, this position, that, that that's the most, I don't know, I explained that kind of botchity. You get it. Just pick. It's supposed to be fun. Um, otherwise, though, we will. Uh, we were going to talk about a Division Three football team getting a custom beer, having a oh, actually a sponsorship or like an arrangement with a brewery, and they get a custom brew. It was posted earlier today on Twitter. It was uh, Cobbler Football and Concord Moorhead in Minnesota. Anyways, I went to go look at when we we're recording the episode. Scrubbed from the internet. Ridiculous. Something went wrong over there in Minnesota, and they scrubbed the whole thing. They scratched it. So. Someone please let me know what happened there. And then we'll finish with some reactions from Thursday Night Football because why the hell not? Go Lions. Brand new Lions as opposed to the same old Lions. But as always, you can find all that and more. Use timestamps at the bottom of the video here on YouTube if you're watching. The chapters, whatever you want to call them, that little red bar, slide it forward. You can find those on Apple Podcasts and Spotify too, wherever you're listening. That'll be in the description. Fast forward to any part of the topics. Follow us. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Hit the subscribe button on the YouTube Let's go over to that first conversation with Sheen. <laughs> Joining the show tonight, this man was dominant in week one, 221 yards, four touchdowns, only nine carries, video game numbers. He's earned NSIC Offensive Player of the Week honors, as well as the same from D2Football.com from Minnesota State, Sheen Butler Lawson Jr. What's going on, brother? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Good, man. You just turn up all your sliders before uh, Saturday or what? Nah, man. <laughs> Look, I was just mad I had to shit out the first half, bro. So that's I think that's yeah. the crazy part too. Is I look at that and you think like, if a dude's just carving up like that, why he's only got nine touches? You had to sit out the yeah. first half. Talk about that and just being so like chomping at the bit to finally just get in there. Obviously, season opener and just you get in that second half, just explode, dude. That's got to be an awesome feeling. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was not too crazy. It was just like a. My teammates set a couple standards, and I ain't meet them. Um, so uh, they just had to hold me accountable, which I can't blame them for. Like, we trying to go to a natty, so sure. it don't matter who you are. We got to hold you to the standard, you know what I mean? So I didn't meet it. Had to set up the first half. Uh, took that to the chin. It is what it is. And then, uh, yeah, I just uh, I was just trying to be a cheerleader for my teammates, being a great teammate that I am, just trying to hype them up. Get them ready to play for that first half to do what we got to do, you know, to win. So, Love it. Yeah, that was pretty much it. So, you come to Minnesota from Missouri Western, right? Yeah. Now, tell me, off the top of your head, do you know how many yards you had over there while you were at Western? I think I had, like, 400 and some. See, some that's like interesting. That. That's interesting, bro, because in your bio, it says you've got – 
385,427 yards. And because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to do my research, you know, before we get guys on here, yeah. just doing like checking stats and things. If I thought that was carving up the other day, you must have had a couple <laughs> years, man. Man, nah, yeah, I for sure saw that. We, we might have get to get so on much. someone over there, a little typo. Yeah, like you feel me? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we just leave it. Maybe we don't say anything. We just leave it. Oh, hey, look better for me. Then, yeah, man. I love it. So, um, but you know, listening to the uh, the NSIC show you just did. Um, yeah, you're a, you're an R&B guy on, on game day, and I, you know, I'm more like oldies and some class i'm a big like soul yeah. guy myself same deal like i don't want to get my heart going the whole day because you just work yourself up into you know what i mean like what am i gonna do bang my head into a wall like you want to be chill until you get right. out there on the field but yep. you're talking about r&b and then you drop finito by keith and you could not yeah. have two more polar opposite song choices but that's just you go from chill and then you got to turn it up right before i go i gotta listen to keith like <laughs> yeah, that just turned me up to a whole different level, you feel me? So it's just like the whole day you gotta be calm though, because you don't wanna just be overthinking everything, you feel me? Mm-hmm. Like right before you go out, there's really nothing else to think about. It's just time to go to work. So I love it. Benito gets you right every time. Yeah, man. And I think people talk about a lot about the analogies in basketball. Like yeah. when a basketball player gets hot, the rim all of a sudden feels like it's three times the size. Everything's falling in. When a baseball player gets hot, it's like a beach ball is coming in instead of a baseball. In football, you have those games at the running back position where sometimes the holes all feel bigger. The game feels like it slows down. Defenders seemingly are way easier to avoid for whatever reason. Yeah. Is that just you get into that kind of zone? I have to imagine that was one of those nights on Saturday. Yeah, man. Uh, like, like I said earlier today, shout out to the O-line, man. Like they sure. was really executing, doing what they needed to do to make my job easier, like, as a running back, I'm always want a one on one with a safety corner. You know, uh, that's just what we thrive on. That's what we want to do. So uh, just getting those one on ones and me being who I am to be able to make those guys miss is just you know what we want. And uh, it just uh, it was everything that we've been preaching about all week going into the game. We got to win our one on ones, whether it's at receiver, running back. O line big on big, like we gotta win. So yeah, yeah, and you talk like glad. schematically, like that's what you want. You can't, you know, you yeah. can't block every dude on the field. You got to get to those one on ones, and that's why the best backs. Well, maybe not right now, but usually the best backs are making the money. Right now, nobody's right. getting paid, which is kind of ridiculous. Right. Yeah. But um, when you can have those one on ones, and you're getting the first and second level, you're getting, uh, you know, bodies on bodies, and you can get to that third level, make a move, run somebody over, whatever it is. That's where you. Uh, that's where you make your money, I guess we'll say. But you had talked about how was it all but one of that O line comes back from last year, like a super veteran group. Yep, um, all but one. Uh, we had an All American center, Jack Russell. He graduated. Gotcha. And, um, Zach Rogo, he was a rotational starter last year, but he played guard. So moving him to center, it, it was probably a pretty good transition for him. But uh, Russell, I, I want to say he was a great mentor to those guys, man. Like, for they sure. all looked up to him. They respected him. So uh, when he left, it was just like next man up, you know. Like, you've been prepping and repping for this, so it's just time to execute, you know. Yeah, no, I hear that. And I already said you had 221 on the ground, but y'all finished with 461 as an offense, which yep. is crazy. And part of that, like you said, you didn't play in the first half, so, um, you know, that was getting split up too. But that number is outrageous. Right. Like, that goes to show that what you're saying, like, yeah, every every good, like, and somewhat selfless back should say, you know, my, my, my offensive line was doing their jobs. They were doing that right. and then some. Dude, that number on the ground is ridiculous. Yep. And when you have that run game, uh, that time of possession, being able to just churn out these long drives down the field – it had to just feel like you guys were just in control of that game, which is a super yeah. comfortable place to be at. Yeah, and, uh, honestly, we just want to get back to old Mankato football. Like that Hell smash yeah. mouth when Nate Gunn was here, uh, they just ran the ball down everybody's throat and they passed it when they needed to. I mean, we still, they still had a same Zilster out there. You know, uh, the previous years we had Jalen Sample. So it's like uh, we got the receivers, you know what I mean? But the pass will never be open if the run isn't working. They got to – we got to be able to get defenders up and respecting the run so the pass is open for those receivers outside. But uh, I think those uh, receivers are taking like that <laughs> no block, no rock 
Like they taking that serious. Like they they want to block. They you know they want to be that and one player for a big run or something like that. It's just the type of team we are. You know, like uh, our uh, slogan: "Brothers in Arm." Bia. Like they believe in that. Everybody who's transferred in because our receiving core, we only bring one guy back that has okay. played. So it's like they're young, but they all buying in. You know, what I mean, we got some transfers. They buying in. So and just all working out. You know, what I mean, so. That's big time. Yeah, and when you go in the film room after a game like that, I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions maybe from people on the outside. When you go into film, yeah. the only reason, you know, that film serves, the only purpose it serves is to correct mistakes. Now, a game after this, yes, you're going to have things that you need to correct. You weren't perfect. Nobody will ever be. Right. But on the other side of that, you have to go through, I'm assuming, and be like, X, Y, and Z, I did these things really well in this game. Now double down and t- continue to improve on those skills. I'm just imagining that's kind of your mindset after a performance like that. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, uh, I'm the type of guy, uh, I harp on the little things. Like, I had a couple runs. Um, I think I had a 12-yarder. I, I could have took that to the career, but it's like those little things that I didn't see in game time. It's like uh, that could have just – boost it another big run or maybe if I made this cut that cut it could have been another run so I mean like you said just a little things in film that you could clean up and uh go on to the next week just try to be better 100% dude last thing for you this weekend for you guys great test in Wayne State at your place against the team that I feel like it's taken on a little bit of that underdog role. We've got a couple of you guys yeah. in Bemidji have those national rankings, and then there's you got a couple of squads like Wayne who had a little bit of hype coming around them, but you know right. maybe been overshadowed. Uh, you guys had them the first round last year in the playoffs, solid game. Uh, talk about you know that contest coming up this weekend. Um, first of all, just playing at home in general, we want to be able to go out and dominate. Um, oh, yeah. In the past, uh, if we. Looking at statistics, if we go undefeated at home, that's a playoff berth. So mm-hmm. uh, we talk about that a lot. Um, just wanted to defend the Blake. You know, uh, that that means something to us, uh, winning at home. So um, Wayne is a great team, man. Like you said, they're underdogs, bro. They have those guys that are still getting looked at on a national scale. Their quarterback's good. They have great linebackers, have good DBs. So we just got to be disciplined, not going in there too overzealous and doing things that – we haven't been doing in practice, you know. Uh, everybody just playing within and doing what we need to do to go one and zero on the week. So, sure. Amen. I'm excited what you see uh, to see what you do in four quarters, dude. Let's put a, let's put a whole game together <laughs> and that monster, that group of monsters you guys have up there. I want to see this more of this old school Mankato ball. I'm excited to uh, watch you this weekend and you know weekends further on, brother. I was there. Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Of course, man. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. I'll see you. Appreciate Sheen joining me tonight on the show. He's uh, first of two guests. We'll have another great guest, Aaron from UW uh, River Falls, joining us later in the episode. Remember to use the timestamps to go forward to that conversation if you'd like. But got another guy joining us. Jimmy's back. What's up, fella? How we doing? How we doing? Big weekend for uh, D two D three. We're gonna start with some Division two previews, and uh, you know, as the conversation probably will remain, we're gonna start talking about mines. We talked a lot about them last episode. We're going to continue to talk about them, especially if they continue to play at the level that they have. This week, number two, Colorado Mines at number six, Angelo State. Angelo State, uh, pretty solid win last week. Road win versus West Alabama, going over there and picking up a pretty convincing W, 38-14 to against the Tigers. And uh, looking at that one, I guess some of the bigger takeaways – Holding West Alabama to under 200 yards of total offense is really impressive. Um, So their defense, definitely a big part of that. The Rams only allowed 130 passing yards per game last year. That number is astounding, especially when you talk about the matchup this week against Matoka, McLeod, that talented receiving room, and what uh, Mines has been able to do offensively, a very potent passing attack. That's going to be, I think, the matchup that will determine how that game really goes. But for me, what I'm really excited to see is that Mines, we talked with Tony last week a lot about their front seven and the physicality that they brought to that Grand Valley game, shutting down the rushing attack and being able to just disrupt Grand Valley's offense. Um, I think people maybe like us always like to focus on the flashy, potent passing attack, that air raid kind of style that Mines has. But, you know, compared to the GLIAC, whereas we're known for a little more of a downhill, gritty style with teams like Ferris and Grand Valley, 
Um, but maybe they should let that, and they probably do. They want it to become more of their identity. They proved it last week against a strong Gleak opponent in Grand Valley, and I think that that physicality is going to become a lot more part of their identity, and they're not a one-trick pony. Like, mine's is extremely physical at the point of attack, and they can still beat you deep with a lot of weapons. So um, to see that offense, and especially defensively, that front seven develop against a really solid Angelo State team is going to be, it should be really fun to watch. Maybe not as fun as that Lions-Chiefs game we just watched, but (laughs) extremely fun, dude. Yeah, definitely. Uh, moving on, though, I just wanted to put a couple cliff notes kind of on each of these these D2 games as we move forward. Another one I'm really excited about, CSU Pueblo, big win for them uh, under first one under Coach Hill uh, over Midwestern State. They go to Grand Valley. So now Grand Valley back-to-back uh, Colorado schools here in back-to-back weeks. Grand Valley now at number four. And all these rankings that I'll talk about and that we'll talk about are from the D2Football.com and D3Football.com lists, respectively. But um, let's look at these next three games for Pueblo before we talk about the Grand Valley one in general. At GVSU, home versus Western Colorado, who's the, probably the third best team in that conference in the RMAC, and then home versus Mines. So a freaking gauntlet the next three weeks for the Thunder Wolves. Uh, they had a great one in week one, but this stretch is going to be a tall task, especially for the new head coach. Now, when you're a new head coach and you have this type of task in front of you, I think, you know, disagree or agree with me here, the expectations – I and. You come at a winning program like CSU Pueblo, so maybe a little bit different. But if you steal one or two of these games, you have exceeded just about all expectations. In in my eyes, I feel like the bar is not like you don't have to go on sweep these next three weeks. Like You go out and steal one or two of these next games against these high-ranked opponents, that's a success, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. So, I mean, you're getting this really stiff competition early in the year. You're going to, you know, build an identity. Absolutely. You know, win or lose. So, yeah. I hear you, man. Now, GVSU, they need to get the rushing attack going this week. We talked about Tariq Reed last week, the rushing attack in general. He was a non factor for a guy as, as talented as he is. Um, and for an offensive line, offensive unit that brings back so much, it was very surprising to see that little production on the ground for the Lakers. But Midwestern State ran for 174 yards for CSU Pueblo. Even though they only scored like seven or eight points, they kept turning the ball over, and they couldn't finish drives at all in that game. For GV, I think they're going to have a lot of opportunities to get things going on the ground, and they're going to need to because the run game is going to open up the passing opportunities. The back end in uh, Pueblo's defensive secondary is stacked across the board. we got a couple preseason All-Americans, all-conference-type players in that back end, guys like Daniel Boone and uh, Bone, excuse me, and, and those type of guys that we talked about with Tony on the show last uh, episode. But if they can get that run game going early, it's obviously – that's going to open up all kinds of opportunities for them through the air with Cade Peterson and um, that passing attack. So for me, I would expect for GV to go heavy into the right early on because that needs to be part of their identity. They weren't able to do that last week. So I feel like, you know, as a coaching staff and as a, a unit, they want to come out there and establish themselves right out the gate, I'd assume. Yeah, and you're 100% right. That's 100. When you have a, when you have a running back like 3 3 2, it's like you got you to gotta give that guy the ball. Yeah, and he's definitely going to get his touches. Dark mode in Lubbers. That'll be a legend. It's supposed to be like a blackout. Um, it got oh, posted wow. on like the Uni Swag Twitter account. was pretty cool. So um, we've seen that. We've seen what that place looks like when they yeah. when they fill it up. The uh, yeah. the home opener against a nationally ranked opponent, Dark Knight, whatever the hell they call it. The place is going to be ridiculous. Yeah, I want to say they can fit like 17,000 people in there. Something like that. Yeah. And just... whatever the number that they can supposedly fit, add – Whatever, you know what I mean? Add yeah. whatever onto it, especially for Absolutely. like an anchor bone or something later in the year. But um, we'll keep running through. Number one, Ferris State, and number 19, Ashland. Biggest improvement offensively, you'll hear a lot of people say it, comes from week one to week two. For Ferris, they started super slow last week versus a very lowly ranked or not ranked Mercyhurst team. Um, they ended up picking it up in the second half, played like the Ferris that we think they could play. But I think they're coming out scoring first possession this week, getting out on top of it, and just putting together a really gruesome drive. Ashland had less than 200 yards of total offense last week, really struggling offensively. They potentially could struggle against this Ferris defense. Now, they let up 407 yards to IUP. The crazy thing is, Jimmy, that was a one-score game. IUP scored with a minute 20 seconds to go in that game. Ashland capitalized on some special teams, defensive opportunities. Their offense was not getting it done, but they found a way to be in that game. So that makes me feel optimistic about Ashland, where they're as a unit and as their identity. But 
Um, they had a solid opening drive last week. Their other touchdown came after a blocked punt. So the wild stat here for me is that Mercyhurst actually had 89 offensive plays compared to Ferris's 57. Is like that makes no sense and like, I got at all. I yeah, that's. I don't get it. Like, that's sustaining wow. drives against what we assume, you know, is going to be a really great defense as this season continues to unfold. Now, Mercier is also able to throw for 307 against the Ferris secondary. Another stat that was surprising. So, not a great start. Did hold them to 57 rushing yards. So, that was a stopping point for the Bulldog defense. So, I think Ferris State has been getting ripped all weekend, if I know anything about Coach Anise and that staff, and they're going to come out with a fire lit under their ass on Saturday. So that would be, that'll be a pretty fun one, man. I think, I think, and again, there, you have a nationally ranked opponent They're Ferris is going to rise to the occasion and show out. I think it's what they do. Yep. You're hundred percent right. Yep. And then we've got, uh, Bowie state at Davenport. Great measuring stick for Davenport. Really the only note I had here, cause they had their way with Thomas Moore in week one, the newest addition to the GMAC coming out of NAIA Jackson Whitaker had a fucking week. Preston Smith, our guy at the wide receiver, one of our D1R athletes, had two tuds in his first game back since uh, the season-ending injury last year, so it was great to see him. Their passing attack was super proficient. Um, defense looked really good, especially early on. They got out early. to like a 21-0 lead. Um, Bowie State, though, coming off a win over FCS Delaware State, so they're going to they're gonna definitely pose a challenge to Davenport, who is nationally ranked right now in the top 25, so I'm very interested to see like I said, a better, better measuring stick, excuse me, for where the Panthers are at as opposed to just week one. And shoot, we'll get a crack at them here soon enough. So that'll be, we'll be able to see that pretty up close and personal. Um, we've got East Stroudsburg at IUP. Stroudsburg offense, they exploded last week. Jim Pace, University, to pick up the win. 62 to 9 was a pretty wild one. Uh, 28 of those points coming in the fourth quarter. Defense forced four fumbles to stay on top. And I talked about IUP a little bit earlier because they played Ashland last week. Uh, and as much as IUP dominated the box score and the stats in that one, like I said, they barely escaped that win. They scored with one minute and 20 seconds left to escape Ashland. I keep using that word, escape. But they need to be more efficient early, finish drives with points, and I think they will. We had Karst Hunter on here a few weeks ago. That's the transfer from Colorado Mesa, who's at the helm for the Red, I think it's the Red Crimson Hawks or something like that. Um, so that'll be definitely one to watch. East Stroudsburg's defense is going to be really stout, so... Uh, excited to see that matchup. Other two ones I had highlighted was number 18, West Georgia at Texas A&M Kingsville, and then uh, South Dakota Mines at Truman State. I think both those have potential to be very even-matched contests. So those, for me, could go either way. I know West Georgia nationally ranked right now, but um, that Texas A&M Kingsville team is going to be stingy, especially on the back end. So uh, excited to see how those pan out, man. But that was my quick – that was the blurb. That was all the – that was all the D2 stuff. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to touch on with that. No, yeah, you covered a lot of the uh, pretty marquee matchups of the week, I would say. You know, I uh, expect nothing less out of you, Kobe. That was pretty quality work there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. But uh, why don't you get us get us going here on some – what do we got going on Division Three wise Yeah, so, you know, a ton of really big matchups. I uh, picked four of them this week that I uh, have my eye on for sure. So uh, the first game I have, I uh, have uh, number 11 – Wisconsin lacrosse takes host to number six, Hardin Simmons. You know, this is obviously massive matchups for both teams. Yep. Uh, lacrosse is looking to build off a 31-6 victory against Dakota State. Uh, they had an interesting kind of situation going on. They were rotating quarterbacks for most of the game. Both quarterbacks played very well. Okay. Kaiser Helterbrand had – he was 12 for 18 with 196 yards and a touchdown. And Zach Wire, forgive me if that's not how you pronounce it, Zach, but uh, – 133 yards and three touchdowns for him. So hey now. Uh, across his quarterbacks came to play last Saturday. So for sure. It's big. And then uh, Harden Simmons will head over to lacrosse in hopes to begin with a 2 0 record as well. They, they beat Albright 47 to 3 last week. So uh, yeah, I expect Harden Simmons to come out firing. You know, that's a massive game for both teams. Talk uh, about that trip, though. I mean, uh, we just saw UMHB make that trip up to River Falls. And I would assume that contributes to part of maybe the slow start for those Texas teams. Uh, both being in the ASC and uh, or ASUN, is it? It's one of the two. ASC, but, ASC. Okay, there you go. And, um, you know, making that trip from Texas all the way up to Wisconsin, like that's going to be something where let's see if, you know, lacrosse gets out early or gets out on top of that because, you know, those, uh, what do you call them, like the plane legs or the travel legs, like those are real. Those are very yeah. real. Oh, so yeah. uh, sure. I think For the sure. crew football, the Crusaders, they found that out the hard way. We'll see if Harden Simmons can can learn from watching that in week one. But talk about yeah. UMHB. I think that's the next one on your list there. Yep, yep. I got uh, – actually, I have 
Yeah, so I had number five, Trinity, taking host to Mary Harden Baylor. Disappointing starts for both teams last week. Um, you know, obviously, Mary Harden Baylor kind of got roughed up a little bit by River Falls, but definitely expect them to bounce back, you know, for sure. Mary Harden Baylor, very, very good program. Um, and then, obviously, you know, Trinity had a barn burner with St. John's. That was our Division One Rejects Game of the Week matchup last week in uh, 37-34 finish, I believe, at, uh, at St. John's. And uh, also, I don't know if you know about this, Kobe, but is that kid from Trinity okay? We got like trampled in that St. John. That St. John's. You're game. talking about the end of the game, that. right? Yeah. Did you see that? That was ridiculous, dude. He's yeah, laying on the ground, I, uh, and there's Kobe. literally a crowd of people just everywhere. Yeah. If uh, if anyone from Trinity is tuning into Division One Rejects, please let us know if that player is okay. I was like, dude, that was cow. that was the insane. whole student section just swarmed him. Like yes. that was crazy. That's nuts, dude. Yeah, yeah that was you. wild. Absolutely wild. But, uh, yeah, obviously, neither of those teams want to start 0-2, so that'll be a massive game. Because, obviously, starting 0-2, that's a pretty deep hole to dig yourself out of, especially in a competitive conference that they're playing in, you know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of good things came out of that one for Trinity. They were, at least for them, fortunately, in a much different position than uh, UMHB, right? Those two games mm -hmm. so different, losing in overtime. Um, the offense for Trinity behind Tucker Horn looked really solid in that week one. He fills up the stat book every week, so you know their offense is going to come out and be super proficient, but um, a loss is still a loss. I don't care if you get beat by one or a hundred. Like, it's still a loss on your record, and that's that ain't, that ain't it. Yeah, no. No one wants to have a loss in the, in the yeah. loss column after week one. That's not where you want to be, but... Yeah, anyway, so uh, into our next matchup here, we got number 19, Wisconsin Oshkosh, heads down to Wheaton. This should be a pretty pretty high marquee matchup as well. Number 19 versus number 13, a top 25 matchup, obviously, you know. Wheaton actually kicking off their season this week. They're 0-0. They have not played a game yet. And uh, okay. as for Oshkosh, Kobe Berghammer with seven touchdowns last week, setting a yep. school record for the Titans. Um, just heck of a game for the uh, – UW quarterback, just got to tip the cap there. I mean, obviously, they'll be game planning for him pretty heavily, I would assume. You know, Wheaton College is very well coached, very well established program. Um, fun little tidbit for you guys. Um, Aiden O'Connell, the Raiders quarterback, was actually committed to Wheaton College out of high school. And then, obviously, he decommitted and went to Purdue. He got a preferred walk-on offer. Really? But, uh, obviously, Wheaton, Wheaton knows how to evaluate talent and bring in good players. So, expect them to have a very good season this year. So. Well, not only is – I mean, Kobe Burkhammer is going to have a year. The dude's freaking athletic. We've seen that firsthand when he came up here and played at Northern. He can run it. He can do it with his legs, do it with his arm. But it helps when you're throwing to what I would assume is probably the best two wide receivers in that conference in Trey Tetzloff and uh, is it Tony Steger. I want to believe are the, are the two of them there. Those two have put up a ton of numbers, and I think that is a big reason why he's having that success because, you know, you could put Patrick Mahomes back there. If he doesn't anyone to throw it to, you're not putting up seven tuts. That's a ridiculous number. So yeah. um excited to see what, what he's got going on. But we got we got one more here that I know you're I know you're excited about. Yeah, so again, uh now again, so division one rejects D three game of the week. St. John's is back in the D D one R game of the week. You know, obviously oh, yeah. another top ten matchup. That's the best matchup on the board. You gotta throw him back in there. So uh St. John's will be at Whitewater this week. I mean, that's just a Pivotal game for both teams. Um, huge, huge win last week over Trinity for St. John's. Um, knocking off number four. And now they're number four. Whitewater not creeps in the top ten as well. So, um, and then obviously the Warhawks are eager to prove that they are who they say they are. You know, they've had this run of prominence and then they kind of had a good year. They went eight and three. But, again, that's not where they want to be. No. That's not what their culture is about. They want to be 15 and 0 every year. So, I mean, they're going to be coming out strong. This should be a dandy, a dandy of a matchup this weekend. And I uh, I don't know who would win this one. I mean, honestly, I was thinking about it, you know, all, the, all day today when I was writing on my uh, little script here. But, man, I, I can't put my – I'm going to win this ballgame, Kobe. I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know about you. but No, it'll be good. Be and I think burner. Burner. Yeah, and it'll be good because, like you said, it's a, it is a big prove-it game for Whitewater. Like, how do I say it, like, in the nicest way possible, like – Stevens Point going eight and three and Whitewater going eight and three are two totally different seasons. You know what I mean? And that's not even yeah. a diss to like one program or the other, but it's like when you have that tradition and the history of winning and that culture of winning, the bar is just set that much higher. Even when we were talking about uh, Pueblo a little bit earlier, right? For a new head coach coming in in her first year, you're typically not expected to. You have three nat almost three nationally ranked opponents in a row. You're not expected to go out there and win all three of those games. Like if you go and steal one or two of those games you are a fantastic success. So 
when you're whitewater, you are expected to sweep and clear the board and win the WEAC mm-hmm. and make it to a deep run in the playoffs and potentially win a national championship to play 15 games, whatever the number is. So um, expectations, certainly high. I'm excited to see that one, though. That'll be good. Join the show tonight. The WEAC Defensive Player of the Week, a captain at UW River Falls, and a big part of their crazy win over UMHB. It's Aaron Borgerding. What's up, brother? How we doing? Excited to get you on here, man. You just showing me a little yeah. bit of the locker room. You guys are living lavish over there. It's spacious. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Got some ping pong tables in here. I love it, dude. That's big time. Now, um, this year, surrounding you guys, uh, off season, preseason, the word hype, and that's like one of my least favorite words because it's like, what does that mean? Like, what is hype? How do you put a tangible to what the hell that means? But there was hype around you guys coming into this year, especially in your conference. Some of the um, you know, the opportunities you guys have to prove yourselves. The first one was week one. The season is far from over. It feels like you guys have started to live up to that word that we can't, uh, you know, put a, a description on. Yeah, that I would agree with that a little bit. We had it's a little bit different of a feeling here preseason and, and spring ball, stuff like that. Okay. So um, it's just cool to, I don't know, not necessarily live up to it, but like kind of rise to it and, and play to what people are expecting us to play like. I like that. Yeah, not like because you don't you don't owe anyone anything. You don't owe any stupid talking head on some yeah. show anything. But rising up to what people maybe say or whatever, I like that. It's a good little it's yeah. a good little verbiage change. Now, um, you know, getting right into that game, you get the interception. Was it the second quarter? Uh, either right at the start of the second quarter or early first quarter, something okay. like that. Got you. So right, very early in the game, you're already up fourteen nothing. You grab that one. I have to imagine somewhere in your head, you just got to think like, man, like, can we blow this thing open? Like, can we really capitalize and just blow this thing out of the water? Yeah. So coach Walker was big on just getting out to a big start. Yeah. And we knew if we could get out to a big start early, put a little doubt in their mind and maybe just try and end things as quickly as we can. You did it. Yeah. Kind of. It kind of seems like you did it. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Special teams was a huge, huge part of that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Getting our offense good, field position, and then executing on our end as well. Oh, 100%. And you guys had big contributors like um, yourself and others in the defensive end. Obviously, uh, quarterback Baja goes off. He has a day, special teams. But it was all three facets, right? There wasn't an area that you guys were necessarily lacking. That's the type of game you need to play when you're in those, I guess, like the nationally ranked type of contests like that. Yeah, for sure. Coach Walker really emphasized on the special teams, execution, and we practice more special teams than – any other week that I've been a part of since I've been here. So that's probably part of the reason there. Okay. I like that. Now you had a day, I said the interception, seven tackles, and it was four solos, two pass breakups, and you're the freaking holder. Are you the holder? Yeah, I am. Our holder from last year had a Achilles injury. So we no. didn't play it all this year. So that's too he's bad, trying to man. teach me his ways. So I, I'm trying to get there. That's, you're trying to break the, the DB's got no hands notion, like one hold at a time. Yeah, for sure. First you might be the first that. defensive back I've seen in that spot, dude. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a work in progress, we'll say that. <laughs> that's yeah. a stressful job. Like, that's a legit – that is a very tough job. It is. I'm not going to lie. That kept me up more at night than, than thinking about the, the other team's offense, for sure. Are you serious? Yeah. It, that's nuts. I know, hey, we've been there. I mean, let's, I had to throw my guys under the bus. NMU watching us play this last week. We had we dropped three punts snaps, and you're not going to be in a game when that happens. No. Like you talk special teams, special teams. There's a reason that guys do that. So I just thought it was pretty cool. I had to I had to mention that I've never I've never seen a, a DB doing that. Now other side of the ball, quarterback Caleb is it Blaha? Yep, Blaha. No relation to to George. Is it George the Pistons? Um, the Pistons guy. Uh, I I don't believe so. That'd be pretty epic, but it might have been a reach yeah. on my part. I'm just, you know, I had, yeah. I had to ask. Um, you know, him, he moves into the, I believe it was the fourth all-time <laughs> offensive yards in program history, made the D3Football.com team of the week, all the accolades, whatever. But what an opener yeah. for him. What did you see from not only him, but that offense coming out? Not only um, very poised, but like you said, striking fast, striking early, and striking often. Yeah, with our offense, it's they're the top gun offense. We try to try to get them the ball as much as we can help them get going. And, like, I didn't see a whole lot because we were talking stuff while they were going. Very but when true. I went back, rewatched it. It's just 
they were able to capitalize on every opportunity that they were given early in the game. So that was huge. That's big. Top Gun offense might be one of the cooler hashtags in college football too. What's the def- What's the defensive one? We're our uh, coach Wiss is a big Cobra Kai guy. So that's our Cobra Kai first. defense. Yep, strike first, no mercy. That's our, our kind of. Model. <laughs> it's not bad either. That's not yeah. bad, but Top Gun offense is is pretty badass. Yeah, for sure. Caleb's Caleb's the Tom Cruise of the operation. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that's good. Um, now you know, obviously. The challenge for you guys, man, a huge emotional win to open up your year. You've got two uh, non-conference, maybe quote-unquote lighter games from an outside perspective before you start that WEAC play. Some people, maybe not necessarily myself, some people would say those are trap games because coming off a huge win like that, all the emotions are riding high, coming in against a couple opponents where, hey, we should handle these guys. Talk about keeping all those guys level-headed over there and approaching these with the same mindset as, you know, a Mary Harden Baylor or a lacrosse, or Whitewater, those type of teams? Yeah. I, a lot of our coaches were talking about trap game, but, like, the way we look at it is, like, we just witnessed that firsthand. Like, Mary Harden Baylor came up here. They're like, oh, it's a team we probably maybe roll with or roll over with. And then it's like we just saw firsthand what happens when you just show up and you don't necessarily execute and plan for a team. So, yeah, being on the other side of that and now – not wanting to be on the other sideline because you see what that yeah. does. Yeah, for sure. That's a that's not a that's not a short trip either to to get beat like that. No, we're taking a bus that's going to be like thirteen hours down there to Ohio. So, you know. it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Even think about UMHB coming up there, man. Talk about not yep. a short trip. Yeah, for sure. It's ridiculous. I like. I've seen a lot more of though. I think this year especially. Um, those non-conference games for these bigger, you know, Division three schools, they seem to be scheduling, you guys included, you know, some really tough non-conference competition, obviously, but on a more national stage, we've really broken out of this, like, very regional or super region type base, and now we get these super interesting matchups, whereas I feel like even just five years ago, that wasn't happening, you know, nearly as often. No, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it's great for the sport, honestly. It helps, like, people like you guys – Give more um, recognition to teams like us, like Mary Harden Baylor, oh yeah, Trinities and, and stuff like that. It just spreads the awareness of like what D three football is all about. Love it, dude. Yeah, Trinity. That that game's gonna be an interesting one this week for sure. But um, talk about just you know after that one, looking back in hindsight, you know, living through that would have been awesome. But now, what are you just excited about? Whether it just be your defensive secondary or this squad as a whole moving forward, man. There's got to be a lot of. Uh, bright points. I'm sure there's some things to fix in film and, you know, to correct, but what are you excited yeah. about the most about this squad moving forward, man? Uh, honestly, I'm just excited to get another opportunity to play the game with some of my best friends and just enjoy the bus and the road trips and all the great memories that come along with playing the game. It's a fair answer. It's a fair answer. That's a vet answer. Hell yeah. You don't get no freshman saying that answer. <laughs> that's good but no i love it dude i'm excited to see um these next couple weeks is ohio wesleyan and then northwestern for you guys before you get into we act play yep yep okay man sweet yeah that's all i got for i told you i'd be super super brief with you tonight man but i appreciate you coming on um congrats on the big w let's go get a couple more here these next couple weeks huh thank you thanks for having me yeah thank you aaron have a good night dude i'll stick right on d3 though i got one for you jim that is kind of a cool tidbit here and that is the division three football team that is getting their own brew getting a custom beer i don't know did you hear anything about that no keep talking keep talking it's pretty it's pretty cool and of course now the tweet doesn't want to load up but it's concordia moorhead in minnesota they're a d3 okay. football team yeah, I'm familiar. I'm familiar. and uh okay good i'm gonna i'm gonna i gotta find the tweet here quick to get uh some more of the information but Basically, they're partnering with a local brewery, and they're getting themselves a custom beer for uh, <laughs> whether it just be their football team or athletics programs. And oh, I love if that. I can find the tweet, I'll pull up the picture. You might not be able Only to see Only for the 21 and older students, though. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had to clarify. We had Come to clarify. On Come on now. Um, no way. Jim might have been deleted. Oh. It might have been deleted. Yeah, because, dude, like, we, we actually had an NIL presentation during fall and they're like, yeah, like, there can be no alcohol involved. So, really? Yeah, no, that's that's not gonna fly. Cause uh, I know a couple of kids on our team wanted to like get, like an NIL from like one of the bars in town, and like they're like, no, you can't do that. 
So. Wait a minute. So this is actually got interesting. Dude, it's yeah, it's it's been scrubbed. Yeah. It's been scrubbed from the internet. I should have saved the photo. Hmm. You're kidding. That's I open up the tweet and there's I got so there. excited for a second. I was like, oh. I do a Google search and it's not there. And it's like I, I mean, I know it was there earlier. I almost I should have screenshotted it. That is real. So something definitely fell through. Now the story is their D3 football team is getting their custom brew taken away. Oh, <laughs> That's no. ridiculous. Bummer. Bummer. There are a couple teams that have done that, though. They're not the first one to do it. And I'll pull up. You won't be able to see this on your end, but the people, the people watching will be able to see this. Um, and I can actually I can show you on my own little camera here, Jim. But check out this. Uh, <laughs> check out the logo of these guys. <laughs> is that not awesome. the coolest thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's a corn cob with like an afro <laughs> i have never seen anything like that there's another one yeah, too. hold on it's very unique I would he's say. awesome very dude he's like yeah. in this one he's like oh, the resolution is not fantastic but he's like leaning up on this on their little logo <laughs> yeah, i think I he's electric yeah, that's awesome. That's one of the cooler that's logos awesome. that I've seen, man. I had to, I had to pull that up. It would have been a much cooler story if I could read you about what the, what kind of beer they had going on over there in Cobbler Country, but just a little corny though. Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> that's been, oh, uh, that's too bad, dude. Um, I did have one other piece here. We've got um, there's an article posted by uh, Wayne Cavati about some Division two players currently on rosters, like making the 53 man. Um, for a bunch of these teams. So we have talked about quite a few of these guys at length. Um, but, you know, I guess we can get you on. We haven't talked with you about Tyson Bage. We talk about, a lot about Tyson on this show, but um, you've got to be excited that he's been just showing out for your for your Bears over there, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's no situation where I wouldn't want Justin Fields to be playing, like, personally, as a Bears fan. But – in a circumstance where Justin Fields couldn't play, I yeah. would be extremely confident in Tyson Bajan going out and winning games for the Bears. I it was so crazy, too, watching and seeing because they signed P.J. Walker to that deal. For them to let him go, I think, is the number one thing shows how confident they are in his ability. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, Bajan's a great athlete, too. He can move. And based on how the Bears run their offense, like, you want a guy that can move a little bit back there. So Absolutely. Yeah, and I think he's actually – as far as quarterbacks on this list, I believe he's the only one. Um, and looking at some of the other positions, we talked about this a little bit more. There's 11 defensive backs on NFL rosters from D2 squads. That's the most out of any wow. position. There's seven defensive linemen, six wide receivers, and then five each of linebackers and running backs. So I would have thought offensive linemen more. Yeah, me too. I feel like that's something that usually translates. But yeah. obviously not. The only, Tyson Bajan is the only uh, – quarterback on an active roster out of a division two right now that's pretty crazy man you just don't it's see that happen impressive. a whole lot that's very impressive you know obviously it's kind of because like quarterbacks kind of like a blue chip position if you want it's very big heavily invested in the draft absolutely and you know a lot of nfl gms are not going to want to take a risk on division two quarterback which you know obviously kind of disappointing sometimes but if you're good enough you're going to make the team and obviously yeah. tyson Bajan showed you set a couple ncaa records it's worth it yeah um, oh, just a few just yeah, a absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Ferris State Bulldogs, no, I mean, no surprise there. They have the most players in the active rosters with three. Yeah. Caleb Murphy made the Titans roster. You got Tavier Thomas with the Texans, and then Zach Sealer, who just signed uh, like thirty-eight million dollar contract extension over there with the Dolphins, the interior defensive lineman. Wow, you know that's, that's big time cash right there, dude. Dude, it's him and uh, is it um, Christian Wilkins? Right over mm -hmm. there at yeah. Miami, those yeah. two are like their interior D line guys. They love them over there. So Sealer is from Ferris, and he was uh, he was an absolute dog. So um, that's pretty sweet. Uh, and then the, otherwise, the Indianapolis Colts and the Dolphins both have four Division two players apiece on their rosters. That's tied for the most of any team. The Packers, Chargers, Lions, and Patriots all have three as well. I'm trying to think Lions wise. I know Trevor Nowoski, our guy from Saginaw, who you may or may not remember, the yeah, linebacker, yeah, he made their yeah. practice squad. He's not on the 53, man, but he made the yeah. practice squad over there, which hey, is pretty cool. That's still, like, really good. Does oh, yeah. it count to have – so if you – you have to come out of a Division two straight – because I know, like, a couple guys, like, is it, is, did Darko make the 53, man, for the Raiders? That's oh, – I don't know. I'm not sure about that, to be honest. Because I don't know if they count it if you, like, go from a D2 to a D1. Like, I don't know. Does that, like, yeah, that's a great question. Know. Maybe your last school had to be a Division two. Yeah. That, you know what I mean? Like, where you that. came from before? Yeah, that checks out. 
I would believe so. But yeah. Um, otherwise, we can just finish off on some because shit, we're already this this far into it. Anyways, let's finish off on some Thursday night football reactions, dude. Like I was telling you beforehand, Lions win over the Chiefs, twenty one twenty. Right was the final, and if you would have yeah. told me that the Lions offense scores fourteen points and wins at Arrowhead, like you're fucking crazy. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean. I think there was some very questionable play calling at the end of the game by the Chiefs. Yes. Uh, Not know, taking a t- or, or, uh excuse me, going for it on fourth and twenty-five on your own what thirty? Yeah. Where you I have mean, three it, timeouts it, and the two-minute warning because there was like two oh nine left. Yeah. Uh, and then another one that kind of was like super overlooked because of that play. It was third and one, and it ran like, like this weird reverse. For- oh yeah. And they got stuffed like, in the back. Give, give the ball to Isaiah Pacheco. Let him get two yards. Like, was that the one where the tight end had the ball and handed it? Yeah, it was It was just a weird play. And it's, it's one of those things, too. Like, weird. the same thing with Dan Campbell's decision, like, early in the game to go for that. The fake punt? Fake punt Are you kidding me? What was it? Dude. Something they're crazy. like their own 18 yeah. or something. Like, so, it's the same thing as that where, like, if Dan Campbell doesn't get that, like people are asking for his head, but like now with that Andy Reed play call, which I'm assuming you're just going to assume it's Andy Reed's doing. If they get that, you're like, Oh, Andy Reed, big brain genius. And then he does, but if he doesn't get it, you're like, Oh, this fucking mustache yeah, like, dude. Like, what is he mm, doing? I don't know. It's obviously, it's really easy to call plays from your couch. I'm yeah. watching the TV. You know, I'm, I was just sitting there on, on the couch. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, ah, just, you got a guy like Pacheco, you can just give the ball to him. It's just, I mean, it's easy. It's I high size 2020. So, yeah, they uh, they split the I'm carries sure. between him and uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire a lot more than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. I think Pacheco got yeah. uh, banged up a little bit earlier on, so maybe that had to contribute yeah. to that. But uh, Edwards Hilaire got a lot more touches than I was expecting to see. Yeah, and there's a I don't know if you saw this either, but with like a second on the play clock, one of the defensive linemen jumped and they didn't hike the ball. Yeah, and he got back across the line of scrimmage. So, and another thing, uh, Juwan Taylor was. Fall starting the entire night. Dude, the they tackle, finally got him in, like, the last five minutes. Of the yeah, game. and, like, they finally called it, but, like, yeah. He was getting a head start every single play. Not, not only was he full starting, bro, they even talked tonight, to, like, but... the official, and he was talking about how, obviously, like, as a tackle or anyone on the line of scrimmage, there, your head has to break the waist of the center to be, like, on side. You know what I mean? Like, to be on the line of scrimmage. Not even close. No. Like, just little no. things like that that are part no. of the rules, nuanced parts of the rules. Like, that cannot go unnoticed for an entire game. They're so lenient on that shit. Mm-hmm. No, Combined with the fact that Patrick weird. Mahomes is already just frustrating to root against because he's so – he's just crafty, dude. He's just clever as hell. But mm-hmm. even he can't be clever enough to make his own receivers catch the ball. Yeah, there's a lot of drops tonight. And the, <laughs> oh, that first in, that first in 10, uh, C- Tony was wide open. It was kind of like li- – it was a little behind him. Yeah. He was wide open. He just caught the ball. Yeah. But, again, easier to say that when you're sitting on your couch. It so. is. It is. Yeah. But, Yeah. That's all we got. That was we, we got through that pretty quick. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. That's been it's been good, man. Yeah, great show. Of course, brother. All right, I'll see you. Have a good one, man. I gotta get to bed, dude. It's late as hell here. Later. See you, dude.